I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla, where I get to tinker with programming languages like JavaScript and Rust, and with things like WebAssembly, which is what I'll be talking about today. And I just want to let you know, if you have any questions as I'm going through the talk, you can put them in the GoTo app, uh, or, of course, ask them at the end. Before I start, I want to let folks know that this talk is a little different from the other talks that I've given. Um, it goes in depth. It doesn't go quite as much in depth as other talks I've given. Uh, but I think you're still going to like it. So first off, what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a way of running programming languages other than JavaScript on the web. Up until now, if you wanted to do something on a web page like run a calculation or change something in the DOM, the only language that you could use was JavaScript. But now that there's WebAssembly, you can use other languages like C or C++ or Rust. You compile them to WebAssembly, and then you can run them on the web page just like you would JavaScript. Now, I wish I had time to go more in detail about the basics of how WebAssembly works, because it is pretty fascinating. But unfortunately, this talk is too jam-packed with the future that I really can't talk too much about what's going on in the present, what already exists. In fact, it's so jam-packed that I can't even go into depth about all the things that are in this talk. But I do like giving more depth. Uh, so I have posted an article uh, two weeks ago. You can find it on the Hacks blog. And that covers a lot of this stuff with extra links to give you that, more, that depth. Now, the first few links in that uh, article are a series that I published when WebAssembly first started being turned on by default in browsers in March of 2017. You might have seen this. This is one of the illustrations from that. One thing that I've noticed and I found interesting since I started talking about WebAssembly back then is this misconception that people have. And the misconception is that the WebAssembly that landed in browsers back in 2017, which we called the minimum viable product or the MVP of WebAssembly, people think that that is the final version of WebAssembly. They think that that is the WebAssembly that we're going to have all the way into the future. And I can understand where that misconception comes from. The WebAssembly community group is really committed to backwards compatibility. So the WebAssembly that you create today will continue working in browsers into the future. But that doesn't mean that it's feature complete. It doesn't mean that WebAssembly has all of the features that it's going to have. And in fact, that's far from the case. There are so many features that are coming to WebAssembly that are going to fundamentally alter the kinds of things that you can do with WebAssembly. I think of these future features kind of like the skill tree in a video game. We fully filled in the top few of these skills, but there's still this whole skill tree below that we need to fill in to unlock all of the applications. So let's look at what's been filled in already, and then we can see what is yet to come. So the very beginning of WebAssembly's story starts with Imscripten which made it possible to run C++ code on the web by transpiling it to JavaScript. And that made it possible to bring large existing C++ code bases for things like games and desktop applications to the web. But it turns out that the JS it automatically generated was still significantly slower than when that same code was running natively. A stroke of insight fixed this, though. One of Firefox, uh, the Firefox JavaScript engines engineers he saw how he could make this run fast, and that gave us Asm.js. Once the other browser vendors saw how fast Asm.js could go, they started adding optimizations to their engines too. But that wasn't the end of the story. That was just the beginning. There were still a lot of things that engines could do to make this faster, but they couldn't do it in JavaScript itself. Instead, they needed a new language, one that was designed specifically to be compiled to, and that was WebAssembly. So what skills were needed for this first version of WebAssembly to get the minimum viable product that could actually run C and C++ code on the web? Well, the folks that were working on WebAssembly knew that they didn't just want to support C and C++. They wanted many different languages to be able to compile to WebAssembly eventually. So they needed a language agnostic compile target. They needed something like the assembly language that things like desktop applications are compiled to, like x86. But this assembly language wouldn't be for an actual physical machine. It would be for a conceptual machine. And that compiler target had to be designed so that it could run very fast. 
Otherwise, WebAssembly applications running on the web wouldn't keep up with users' expectations for smooth interactions and gameplay. And there's also load time. Users have certain expectations about how quickly something will load. So for desktop applications, the expectation is that they'll load fast because they're already installed on your computer. For web applications, the expectation is also that they'll load pretty fast because web applications are usually designed so that they don't have to deliver too much data over the network. When you combine these two things, though, it gets tricky. Desktop applications are usually pretty large code bases. So when they're on the web, there is a lot to download and compile when the user first goes to the URL. So we needed our compiler target to be compact so that it could go over the web quickly. The languages that target WebAssembly, they also needed to be able to use memory differently from the way that JavaScript uses memory. They needed to be able to directly manage their memory to say which bytes go together. And this is because languages like C and C++ have a low-level feature called pointers. You can have a variable that doesn't have a value in it, but instead has the memory address of a value. So if you're going to support pointers, the program needs to be able to write and read from particular addresses. But you can have the program that you downloaded from the web just accessing bytes and memory willy-nilly using whatever addresses they want. So in order to create a secure way of giving access to memory like a native program is used to, we had to create something that could give access to very specific parts of memory and nothing else. To do this, WebAssembly uses a linear memory model. And this is implemented using these things called typed arrays, which is basically just like an array, like a JavaScript array, except that this array only contains bytes of memory. So when you're accessing it, you're just using the array indexes, which you can treat as though they were memory addresses. And this means that you can pretend that this array is C++ memory. So with all of these things in place, you could run desktop applications and games in your browser as if they were running natively on your computer. And that was pretty much the skill set that WebAssembly had when it was released as an MVP. It truly was an MVP, a minimum viable product. It allowed certain kinds of applications to work. And you may have actually seen one of these applications. We uh, had this arch at JSConfEU here in Berlin a few months ago. And it's also been at GitHub Universe. It's going to other conferences that you can program. Uh, you can program animations on this space using WebAssembly. So if you get a chance, you should check this out. Even though the MVP opened up some use cases, though, there were still a host of others to unlock. The next achievement to unlock is heavier weight applications. Can you imagine if something like Photoshop were running in your browser, if you could instantaneously load it on any device like you do with Gmail? We've already started seeing things like this. For example, the AutoCAD team has made their CAD software available in the browser. And Adobe has made Lightroom available through the browser using WebAssembly as well. But there are still a few features that we need to put in place to make sure that all these applications, even the heaviest of heavyweight applications, can run well in the browser. So one big one, we need support for multi-threading. Modern day computers have multiple cores. It's basically like a head that has multiple brains that can all be working on the same problem at the same time. And that can make things go much faster. But to make the use of those cores, you need to support threading. Alongside threading, there's another technique that utilizes modern hardware and which enables you to process things in parallel. That is SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. With SIMD, it's possible to take a chunk of memory and split it up across different execution units, which are kind of like cores. And then you have the same bit of code, the same instruction, run across all of those execution units, but they'll each be acting on their own bit of the data. Another hardware capability that WebAssembly needs to take full advantage of is 64-bit addressing. Memory addresses are just numbers. So if your memory addresses are only 32 bits long, you can only have so many memory addresses. You can only have enough addresses for four gigabytes of linear memory. But with 64-bit addressing, you have 16 exabytes. Now, of course, you don't actually have 16 exabytes of actual memory in your computer. So the maximum is subject to however much memory your system can actually give you. But this takes the artificial limitation on address space out of WebAssembly. For these applications, we don't just need them to run fast, though. We need load times to be even faster than they already are 
there are a few skills that we need specifically to improve load times. One big step is to do streaming compilation, to compile a WebAssembly file while it's still being downloaded. WebAssembly was designed specifically to enable easy streaming compilation. In Firefox, we actually we compile it so fast, faster than it's coming in over the network, that it's pretty much done compiling by the time you finish downloading the file. And other browsers are adding streaming, too. Another thing that helps is having a tiered compiler. For us in Firefox, that means having two compilers. The first one, the baseline compiler, kicks in as soon as the file starts downloading. And the code it generates is fast, but it's not 100% as fast as it could be. To get that extra bit of performance, we run another compiler called the optimizing compiler on several threads in the background. Now, this one takes longer to compile, but it generates extremely fast code. So once that's done, we swap out the baseline version with the fully optimized version. And we're also working on a new optimizing compiler called CraneLift. It's designed to compile code quickly. It can compile code in parallel at a function by function level. At the same time, the code it generates gets even better performance than our current optimizing compiler. And this is in the development version of Firefox right now. It's disabled by default. Um, but once we enable it, we'll get to the fully optimized code even quicker, and that code will run even faster. But there's an even better trick that we can use to make it so that we don't have to compile at all in most of the cases. With WebAssembly, if you load the same code on two page loads, it will compile to the same machine code. It doesn't need to be changed based on whatever data is flowing through the code, as optimized JavaScript JIT compilation does. This means that we can store the compiled code in the HTTP cache. Then when the page is loading and goes to fetch the WASM file, instead of pulling out the, the file itself, it'll pull out the pre-compiled machine code from that cache. So this skips compiling completely for any page that you've already visited that's in the cache. And there are other ways that we can speed this up even further, where we can skip even more work. So stay tuned to see what else happens to improve load times. Where are we with supporting these heavyweight applications right now? For threading, we have a proposal that's pretty much done, but a key piece of that, shared array buffers, had to be turned off in browsers early th earlier this year, and they're going to be turned on again. Uh, turning them off was just a temporary security measure to reduce the impact of the Spectre security issue that was discovered in CPUs earlier this year. But progress has been made, so stay tuned for that. SIMD is under very active development at the moment. WASM64, for this, we have a good picture of how it will work, and it's pretty similar to how x86 or ARM added their support for 64-bit addressing. We added streaming compilation almost a year ago in Firefox, and other browsers are working on this now, too. And we also added our baseline compiler around the same time. And some other browsers have been adding this same kind of architecture over the last year. In Firefox, we're getting close to landing support for implicit HTTP caching, and these other improvements are in discussion. Even though this is all still in progress, you already see some of these heavyweight applications coming out today because WebAssembly already gives these applications the performance that they need. But once these features are all in place, that's going to be another achievement unlocked. And more of these heavyweight applications are going to be able to come to the browser. But WebAssembly isn't just for games and for these heavyweight applications. It's also meant for regu regular web development, for the kind of well web development that web developers are used to, the small modules kind of web development where small WebAssembly modules can be introduced in places where WebAssembly makes sense. Those little corners of your app where the app has to do a lot of heavy processing and which could run faster with WebAssembly. And again, this is a case where some of it's already happening. You're already seeing small WebAssembly modules being incorporated in places where you have tiny modules doing lots of heavy lifting, like the parser in the source maps library that's used in Firefox DevTools and in Webpack. By rewriting this source maps parser in WebAssembly, the team saw an 11-fold speed up. And WordPress is seeing an average speed up of 86 times faster with WebAssembly in their new parser as well. But for this kind of use to be really widespread, for people to be really comfortable doing it, we need to have a few more things in place. So first, we need fast calls between JavaScript and WebAssembly. Because if you're integrating a small module into 
an existing JavaScript system, there's a good chance that you'll need to call between the two languages a lot. So you'll need those calls to be fast. But when WebAssembly first came out, these calls weren't fast. This is where we get back to that whole MVP thing. The engines had the minimum support for calls between the two. They just made the calls work. They didn't make them fast. So engines need to optimize here. We've recently finished our work on this in Firefox. Now some of these calls are actually faster than non-inlined JavaScript to JavaScript calls. And other engines are also working on these improvements. That brings us to another thing, though. When you're calling between JavaScript and WebAssembly, you often need to pass data between them. You need to pass values into a WebAssembly function or return value from it. This can also be slow, and it can be difficult, too. There are a couple of reasons why it's hard. One is because, at the moment, WebAssembly only understands numbers. This means that you can't pass more complex values like objects in as parameters. You need to convert that object into numbers and then put it into linear memory. Then you pass WebAssembly the location in linear memory. But that's kind of complicated. And it takes some time to convert the data into linear memory. So we need this to be easier and faster. Another thing that we need is integration with the browser's built-in ES module support. Right now, if you initiate a WebAssembly module, you have to use an imperative API. So you call a function, and that gives you back the module. But that means that the WebAssembly module isn't really part of JavaScript's module graph. In order to use import and export, like you do with JavaScript modules, you need to have that integration. Just being able to import and export doesn't get us all the way there, though. We need a place to distribute these modules and to download them from, and tools to bundle them up. What's the NPM for WebAssembly? Well, what about NPM? What's the Webpack or Parcel for WebAssembly? Well, what about Webpack and Parcel? These modules shouldn't look any different to the people that are using them. So there's no reason to create a whole separate ecosystem. We just need tools to integrate with them. There's one more thing that we need to do really well in existing JavaScript applications, and that's support for older versions of browsers, even those that don't know what WebAssembly is. We need to make sure that you don't have to write the whole second implementation in JavaScript just so that you can support IE 11. So where are we on this? Well, calls between JavaScript and WebAssembly are fast in Firefox now, and other browsers are also working on it. For easy and fast data exchange, there are a few proposals that will help with this. Now, as I mentioned before, one reason you have to use linear memory for more complex kinds of data is because WebAssembly only understands numbers. The only types it has are ints and floats. With the reference types proposal, this will change. This proposal adds a new type that WebAssembly functions can take as arguments in return. And this type is a reference to an object from outside WebAssembly, so a JavaScript object. Now, WebAssembly can't operate directly on this object. To actually do things like call a method on it, it will still need to use some JavaScript glue code. So this means it works, but it's slower than it needs to be. To speed things up, there's a proposal that we've been calling the host bindings proposal, although that name's likely to change soon. It lets a WebAssembly module declare what glue must be applied to its imports and exports, so that that glue doesn't need to be written in JavaScript. And by pulling this glue from JavaScript into WebAssembly, the glue can be optimized away completely when calling built-in web APIs. There's one more part of the interaction that we can make easier. And that has to do with keeping track of how long data needs to stay in memory. If you have some data in linear memory that JS needs to access, then you have to leave it there until the JavaScript reads that data. But if you leave it in there forever, you have what's called a memory leak. How do you know when you can delete the data? How do you know when JavaScript is done with it? Currently, you have to manage this yourself. Once the JavaScript is done with the data, the JS code has to call something like a free function to free the memory. But this is tedious and error prone. To make this process easier, we're adding weak refs to JavaScript. With this, you'll be able to observe objects on the JavaScript side and then do cleanup on the WebAssembly side when that object is garbage collected. So these proposals are all in flight. In the meantime, the Rust ecosystem has created tools that automate this all for you and that polyfill the proposals that are in flight. One tool in particular is worth mentioning because other languages can use it too. It's called WASM BindGen. 
When it sees that your Rust code should do something like receive or return certain kinds of JavaScript values or DOM objects, it will automatically create the JavaScript glue code that does this for you so that you don't even need to think about it. And because it's written in a language-independent way, other language tool chains can adopt it too. For ES module integration, we have the proposal pretty much done and are now working with browser vendors to implement it. And for tool chain support, there are tools like WAS and PACK in the Rust ecosystem, which automatically runs everything you need to package your code for NPM. And the bundlers are also actively working on support. Finally, for backwards compatibility, there's the WASM to JS tool. That takes a WASM file and spits out its equivalent JS. Now, this JS is not going to be fast, but at least it means that it will work in older versions of browsers that don't understand WebAssembly. So we're getting close to unlocking this achievement. And once we unlock it, we open the path to another two. One is rewriting large parts of things like JavaScript frameworks in WebAssembly. And the other is making it possible for statically typed compile to JS languages to compile to WebAssembly instead. For example, having languages like Scala.js or Reason or Elm or Kotlin compile to WebAssembly. For both of these use cases, WebAssembly needs to support high-level language features. First, let's look at rewriting parts of JavaScript frameworks. This could be good for a couple of reasons. For example, take React. One thing that you could do is rewrite the DOM diffing algorithm in Rust, which has very ergonomic multi-threading support. And that way, you could easily parallelize that algorithm. You could also speed things up by allocating memory differently. In the virtual DOM, instead of creating a bunch of objects that need to be garbage collected, you could use a special memory allocation scheme. For example, you could use a bump allocator scheme, which has extremely cheap allocation and all at once deallocation. So that could potentially help speed things up and reduce memory usage. But you'd still need to interact with JavaScript objects, things like components from that code. You can't just write everything to linear memory because that would be difficult and inefficient. So you need to be able to integrate with the browser's GC at the same time. Because even if you're managing the virtual DOM structure in linear memory, we still have a lot of these JS objects that you're going to need to reference. Things like components that need to be managed by the JavaScript VM. Some of these JavaScript objects need to point to data in linear memory. And sometimes the data in linear memory will need to point to the JavaScript objects. If this ends up creating cycles, it can mean trouble for the garbage collector. It means the garbage collector won't be able to tell if the objects are being used anymore, so they'll never be collected. So WebAssembly needs integration with the GC to make sure that these kinds of cross-language data dependencies work. And this will also help languages that compile to JS, like Scala.js, Reason, and Elm, because they use JavaScript's garbage collector when they compile to JS. Because WebAssembly will have support for the same GC as JavaScript, the one that's built into the engine, these languages will be able to compile to WebAssembly and just use the same garbage collector. They won't need to change how G GC works in their language. We also need better support for handling exceptions. Some languages like Rust do without exceptions. But in other languages like C++, JS, or C Sharp, exception handling is sometimes used extensively. You can polyfill exception handling currently, but the polyfill makes the code run really slowly. So the default when compiling to WebAssembly is currently to compile without exception handling. But since JavaScript has exceptions, even if you've compiled your code not to use exceptions, you could have an exception still thrown into the works if you call a function, a JavaScript function, and it throws an exception. And languages like Rust choose to abort in this case. So we need to make this work better. Another thing that people working with JS and compile to JS languages are used to having is good debugging support. DevTools and all of the major browsers make it easy to step through JavaScript. We need the same level of support for debugging WebAssembly in browsers, too. And finally, for many functional languages, you need to have support for something called tail calls. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the details on this, but basically, it lets you call a new function without adding a new stack frame to the stack. So for functional languages that support this, we want WebAssembly to support it, too. So where are we on this? 
For garbage collection, there are two proposals currently underway, the typed objects proposal for JavaScript and the GC proposal for WebAssembly. Typed objects will make it possible to describe an object's fixed structure. And this is going to be discussed at an upcoming TC39 meeting. WebAssembly's GC will make it possible to directly access that structure. And this proposal is under very active development. With both of these in place, both JavaScript and WebAssembly will know what an object looks like and can share that object and efficiently access the data stored on it. Our team actually already has a prototype of this working. But it's going to take some time for these to go through standardization, so we're probably looking at some time next year. Exception handling is still in the research and development phase. And there's work now to see if it can take advantage of other proposals, like the reference types proposal that I mentioned before. For debugging, there's currently some support in browser dev tools. For example, you can step through the text format of WebAssembly in Firefox's debugger, but it's still not ideal. We want to be able to show you where you are in your actual source code, not in the assembly. The thing that we need to do for that is to figure out how source maps or a source maps type of thing work for WebAssembly. So there's a subgroup of the WebAssembly community group that's working on specifying that. And the tail calls proposal is also underway. Once those are all in place, we'll have unlocked JavaScript frameworks and many compiled to JS languages. So those are all achievements that we can unlock inside the browser. But what about outside the browser? Now, you may be confused when I talk about outside the browser. Because isn't the browser what you use to view the web? And isn't that right in the name WebAssembly? But the truth is, the things that you see in the browser, the HTML and CSS and JavaScript, are only part of what makes the web. They are the visible part. They are what you use to create a user interface. So they are the most obvious. But there's another really important part of the web which has properties that aren't as visible. That is the link. And it's a very special kind of link. The innovation of this link is that I can link to your page without having to put it in a central registry and without having to ask you or even know who you are. I can just put the link there. It's this ease of linking without any oversight or bottlenecks that enabled the web that we have today. That's what enabled us to form these global communities with people that we didn't know. But if all that we have is the link, there are two problems here that we haven't addressed. The first one is, you go visit the site and it delivers some code to you. How does it know what kind of code it should deliver to you? Because if you're running on a Mac, then you need a different kind of machine code than you do for Windows. That's why you have different versions of, of programs that you buy when you run, a, run them on different operating systems. Should a website have a different version of the code for every possible device? No. Instead, the site has one version of code, the source code, and that's what's delivered to the user. Then it gets translated to machine code on the user's device. The name for this concept is portability. So that's great. You can load code from people who don't know you and who don't know what kind of device you're running. But that brings us to a second problem. If you don't know these people whose web pages you're loading, how do you know what kind of code that they're giving you? It could be malicious code. It could be trying to take over your system. Doesn't this vision of the web, running code from anyone whose link you follow, mean that you have to blindly trust anyone who's on the web? This is where the other key concept from the web comes in. And that's the security model, which I'll call the sandbox. Basically, the browser takes the page, the other person's code, and instead of letting it run around willy-nilly in your system, it puts it in a sandbox. And it puts a couple of toys in there that aren't dangerous so that the code can do some things, but it leaves the dangerous things outside of the sandbox. So the utility of the link is based on these two things, portability, the ability to deliver code to users and have it run on any type of device that can run a browser, and the sandbox, the security model that lets you run that code without risking the integrity of your system. So why does this distinction matter? Why does it make a difference if we think of the web as something that the browser shows us using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, or if we think of the web in terms of portability and the sandbox? because it changes how you think about WebAssembly. You can think about WebAssembly as just another tool in the browser's toolbox, which it is. It is another tool in the browser's toolbox, 
but it's not just that. It also gives us a way to take these other two capabilities of the web, the portability and the security model, and take them to other use cases that need them too. We can expand the web past the boundaries of the browser. Now, you may be thinking that this already happened with Node.js. But as it is today, Node doesn't quite get us there. It doesn't give us full portability. And it doesn't give us the same security, the same confidence in untrusted code either. Node takes JavaScript from the client side, making it possible to run it on servers and other devices. So that does give us some portability. It makes it possible to run JS code on all sorts of different machines. But you still need to use native modules in a lot of cases, because native modules often perform better. Or you might already have code written in a language like C, which you want to reuse in your app. But native modules aren't run in the engine. They have to be compiled for the specific kind of machine that the user is running on. So this doesn't give us full portability. We're also still missing security. Node could have taken the sandbox from the browser, but Node made the design decision early on that JavaScript modules would have access, full access to dangerous things. So JavaScript modules can do things like write files and read files off of your machine. These capabilities, things like full direct file access, are dangerous toys, those dangerous toys that we don't allow in the browser. Even though they are dangerous, though, for the kinds of use cases that Node was built for, these kinds of, this kind of access does make a certain amount of sense. The thing I want to make clear here, though, is that Node made a choice. And really, it is that Node had a choice to make. Because with the way that the JS engine works, the only functionality that JavaScript has access to is what you give to it. So for JS modules, Node could have made a different choice about sandboxing. But for native modules, sandboxing is less of a choice. Now for Node, this is a moot point. They've already made the decision that everything's going to be able to access system resources in dangerous ways. So there's not much point in thinking through how you could restrict native modules access. If you're running a Node application on your computer, you've basically said, I trust this code. But what about other use cases? Wouldn't it be nice to have both the portability and the security of the web to be able to run untrusted code on any kind of device without really thinking about it? WebAssembly makes this possible. WebAssembly starts with the advantages of JS, portability, and the ability to be sandboxed. And what it adds is performance. It gives developers the performance that they need, which means that they don't have to resort to unsandboxed native code to get that performance. So, the use cases that could benefit from this, things like the cloud and blockchain and the Internet of Things, will now have access to them. And I'll talk more about how WebAssembly gives them the access to those things. But I want to finish up with Node first. Because even though Node has no use for WebAssembly's ability to run untrusted code, WebAssembly can still help Node. So what could we do with Node? How, we could, it, how could we improve Node with WebAssembly? we could build, bring full portability to Node. Like I said before, Node gives you most of the portability uh, that JavaScript has on the web. But you still need native modules, which are written in languages like C, which need to be compiled for the specific kind of machine that the user is running on. And that, comp that compilation happens when the user installs, or the maintainer will pre-compile these things as binaries and maintain this whole matrix of different binaries. Now, if these native modules were written in WebAssembly instead, they wouldn't need to be compiled specifically for the target architecture. Instead, they just run in JavaScript like Node runs. But they do it at nearly native performance. So we'd get to full portability for the code running in Node. You could take the exact same Node app and run it across all different kinds of devices without having to compile anything. But WebAssembly doesn't have direct access to the system's resources. We need to pass in functions so that it could work with the operating system, just as we do with the JavaScript modules in Node. For Node, this will probably include a lot of the functionality that's in things like the C standard library and things that are part of POSIX, the portable operating system interface, which is an older standard that helps with compatibility. So modules would definitely need a bunch of, of POSIX-like functions. All that the Node core folks would need to do is figure out the set of functions to expose and the API to use for doing that. But wouldn't it be nice if that were actually something that was standard? 
not something that was constrained to just Node, but that also could be used across other runtimes and other use cases too. A POSIX for WebAssembly, if you will. A POSIX, a portable WebAssembly system interface. And if that were done in the right way, you could even implement the, implement the same API for the web. These standard APIs could be polyfilled into existing web APIs. And these functions wouldn't be part of the WebAssembly spec. There would be WebAssembly hosts that wouldn't have them available. But for those platforms that could make use of them, there would be a unified API for calling these functions, no matter which platform the code was running on. And this would make universal modules, ones that run both in Node and in the web, so much easier. So is something like that something that could actually happen? A few things are working in this idea's favor. There's a proposal called package name maps that will provide a mechanism for mapping a module name to a path to load that module from. And that will likely be supported by both browsers and Node, which can use it to provide different paths and th thus load entirely different modules, but with the same API. With that mechanism in place, what's left to do is actually figure out what functions make sense and what their interfaces should be. There's no active work on this at the moment, but a lot of discussions are happening and heading in this direction. So it looks likely to happen in one form or another, which is good because unlocking this gets us halfway to unlocking some other use cases outside the browser. And with this in place, we can accelerate the pace. So what are some examples of these other use cases? One of them is things like CDNs and serverless and edge computing. So these are use cases where you're putting your code on someone else's server. And that person makes sure that the server is maintained and that the code is close to all of your users. Why would you want to use WebAssembly in these cases? There's a great talk explaining exactly this at a conference recently. Fastly is a company that provides CDNs and edge computing. And their CTO, Tyler McMullen, explained it this way, and I'm paraphrasing here. If you look at how a process works, code doesn't have boundaries. Functions have access to whatever memory in that process they want to access, and they can call whatever other functions they want. When you're running a bunch of different people's services in the same process, this is an issue. Now, sandboxing could be a way to get around this, but then you get to a scale problem. For example, if you use a JavaScript VM like Firefox's Spider Monkey or Chrome's V8, you get a sandbox, and you can put hundreds of instances into the process. But with the numbers of requests that Fastly is servicing, you don't just need hundreds per process, you need tens of thousands. Now, Tyler does a better job of explaining all of this in his talk, so you should go watch that. But the point is that WebAssembly gives them the safety, speed, and the scale needed for this use case. So what do they need to make this work? They needed to create their own runtime, which means taking a WebAssembly compiler, something that can compile WebAssembly to machine code, and combining it with the functions that I was just talking about. For the WebAssembly compiler, they used one that, the one that we're working on at Mozilla called CraneLift, which is very fast and doesn't use much memory. For the functions that interact with the rest of the system, they had to create their own, because we don't yet have that portable interface available. So it is possible to create your own runtime today, but it takes some effort. And it's effort that will have to be duplicated across different companies. What if we didn't just have the portable interface, but we also had a common runtime that could be used across all of these companies and all of these other use cases? That would definitely speed up development then other companies could just use that runtime like they do with Node today, instead of creating their own from scratch. So what's the status of this? Even though there's no standard runtime yet, there are a few runtime projects in flight right now. These include Wavum, which is built on top of LLVM, and Wasmjit. And we're planning one that's built on top of CraneLift. It's called Wasm Time. And if you want to get involved with that, feel free to come up to me after this talk. One thing I forgot to mention about why WebAssembly is useful for things like serverless and edge computing is that when you're running on someone else's server, they need to figure out how much to charge you. They need to figure out how many CPU cycles you used. Some places call this fuel. They talk about how much fuel you used. But this can be hard to do when different programs are running simultaneously on the same machine. But since WebAssembly is pretty close to actual assembly, it makes it easier to see how much fuel something will use. 
Another use case that uses this concept of fuel or gas is the blockchain. Now, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to explain the blockchain, both because this talk is short and because the blockchain is really hard to explain. But there are some versions of the blockchain that can really benefit from WebAssembly. For example, the Ethereum community is moving towards WebAssembly. In Ethereum, there are, there are these bits of code called smart contracts, and anyone can write a smart contract, and then other people called miners have to run that smart contract on their machines. So this should sound familiar. It's the untrusted code problem that we talked about before. Up until now, the Ethereum community has dealt with this by having their own language called Solidity, which restricts what the code can do, but it's a pretty high-level language. And it was hard to calculate how much gas, how many cycles executing that code would take. So WebAssembly is a good option for them. It gives them security, makes it easier to calculate gas cost, and it opens up smart contracts to a host of new languages. You can think of these blockchain platforms as almost like a new kind of operating system. But WebAssembly can also be used in more traditional operating systems. Now, be clear, I'm not talking about running WebAssembly in the kernel, although brave souls are trying that. But I'm talking about running WebAssembly in Ring 3 in user mode. Then you could do things like have a portable CLI tool that could be used across all different kinds of operating systems. And this is pretty close to another use case, the Internet of Things. This includes things like wearable technology and smart home applications. Now, these are usually resource constrained. They don't pack much computing powder, power, and they don't have much memory. And this is exactly the kind of situation where a compiler like CraneLift and a runtime like Wasm time would make sense, because they would be efficient and low memory. And there are so many of these different kinds of devices that are all slightly different. So WebAssembly's portability would really help with that. So that's one more place where WebAssembly has a future. Now let's zoom back out and look at this skill tree. I said at the beginning of the talk that people have a misconception about WebAssembly. This idea that the WebAssembly that landed in the MVP was the final version of WebAssembly. I think you can see now why this is a misconception. Yes, the MVP opened up a lot of opportunities. It made it possible to bring a lot of desktop applications to the web. But we still have many use cases to unlock. From heavyweight desktop applications to small modules to JavaScript frameworks to all of the things outside of the browser, like Node and serverless and the blockchain and portable CLI tools and the Internet of Things. So the WebAssembly that we have today is not the end of the story. Because WebAssembly still has promise to keep and many places to go before it sleeps. Now, before I finish up, I just want to give a bit of thanks. I really enjoy working at Mozilla because I get to work on these cutting edge technologies. But I also enjoy it because I work on engaging problems with some very smart and interesting people. And I had the chance to collaborate with two of them on this talk. Luke Wagner, who is one of the co-creators of Asm.js and was a major driving force in making WebAssembly happen. And Till Schneiderite, who leads our WebAssembly developer tooling efforts at Mozilla. So thank you to both of them. And thank you all for listening.